Happy Monday everyone, this is Martha with Nature Niche and this week I thought I would share a really cool little native shrub, uh, New Jersey tea. So the scientific name is Ceanothus americanus and it is a native upland shrub. If you find it out in the wild, it's a pretty conservative species with a coefficient of conservatism of eight. So you're in a pretty good, like high quality habitat if you find this shrub um, in a natural habitat. So look for it in dry, open, sandy, outwash plains and prairies. Um, sometimes it spreads along sandy roadsides and it's in dry savannas with oak and pine and aspen. And you can find it in transition areas between um, forests and wetter lakes and marshes as well and along riverbanks. Um, it is known across much of the lower peninsula and has a few county occurrences in the upper peninsula. And as far as um, horticulture goes, this is a really great little shrub to plant in residential, urban, commercial settings. It only gets about um, one to three feet tall. It blooms in June into early July when there can sort of be a lull in bloom period. Um, so it provides, you know, flowers when a lot of other things aren't flowering and it has a very pleasant uh, floral fragrance. It prefers full sun to light shade and dry to average soils. Um, and it does add nitrogen to poor site soil. So it's great for doing um, prairie or savanna restorations as well through nitrogen fixation. It's quite uh, drought resistant. It has a pretty stout tap root, and uh, although the leaves may discolor or shrivel a little bit with rain, they'll often, often revive. So nice drought tolerant species. Um, it sends up multiple stems from the base of the plant, and they tend to be erect to ascending. Uh, they may flop in a heavy rain, as you can see here, we just got a bunch of rain, um, and they can get a little leggy if they're in too shady of site conditions, but they're pretty free of foliar disease. And uh, when they're small, they, they transplant well with that big deep tap root, the, the larger ones are harder to move. It can be difficult to germinate from um, seed, however, and it takes a while. And uh, it is a fire adapted species and tolerant of grazing. So you can cut it back um, each spring. Uh, Natural dieback happens with this species, so you'll get um, branches like this. Um, you can prune those back if you like. You can cut the shrub back um, in early spring, and the flowers occur on the new shoots, the new wood for the, any given year. So you can let it be natural or um, trim it back if you like. And uh, it's also fairly salt tolerant in well-drained soils. So something you could put um, along a driveway or along a sidewalk or a roadside. Um, and it's commonly used uh, in native plantings in residential areas as a shrub border or a foundation planting. And it looks really beautiful when planted in mass. As far as identification goes, um, the stems tend to be uh, a yellow green color and pubescent or hairy. Uh, older growth and with sun exposure, those can turn red. The leaves are either um, opposite or alternate. Most of these look like they are alternately arranged. And they're also hairy. And they occur along the entire length of the, the stems coming from the base of the shrub. They're approximately three inches long by up to two inches wide. And uh, they have very fine serrations along the leaf margin. And then the really key characteristic I look for are the vein, um, the unique vein pattern. So it has one central vein and then two primary lateral veins that are palmate, which is just a, a fancy way of saying they come from the base of the leaf, like the fingers on the palm of your hand. And then the 
other veins are pinnate. So they come off to the side all along that and those sort of wrinkle the surface of the leaf. So I look for those three primary veins from the leaf base, um, serrate margin, and a cute little shrub in you know, dry sandy sites. That's how I identify it in the wild. Um, what else? The flowers are compound in uh, panicles. You can see that here, they branch and then they branch again. And there are two to five inches long um, and can get up to two to three inches wide. But each tiny flower has five white sepals, five white petals, five stamens, and one pistil. And um, those flowers will turn into three lobed capsules. That's the kind of fruit it has. And those become dark brown to black and they split open and mechanically eject the seeds up to several feet from the mother plant. Um, and once those seeds fall off, I think they tend to look like um, little uh, martini glasses or little like satellite dishes. It's, it's really a neat plant. You could even do little dried arrangements with the um, old seed capsules. As far as fauna goes, um, the plant just hosts a huge variety of our native pollinators. The nectar and the pollen of the flowers attract many insects, including many types of bees, wasps, flies, beetles, um, and even hair streak butterflies or other butterflies enjoy the nectar. New Jersey tea is the larval host of several moth species like the sulfur moth and um, it's also the larval host plant of spring and summer azure butterflies and the mottled dusky wing skipper. Um, besides our pollinators, our native birds like goldfinches um, as well as house finches and other species like to eat the seeds. So I'm still working on telling the different kinds of bees apart but I can tell you the black and red Critter there is a small milkweed bug, and those are also uh, flies. So the foliage and stem of uh, New Jersey tea, that's often grazed uh, in the wild by elk and deer. And of course, that'll happen in residential settings as well. Rabbits or even livestock. Um, and wild turkey and bobwhite quail also use them as a food source. So it's a good idea to cage them the first year or two, let them um, get their roots well established so that they can sprout back from um, that uh, grazing action by, by different wildlife. Humans um, also use this plant historically. Uh, the colonists during the Revolutionary War used it as a substitute for tea, even though uh, the leaves do not um, contain any caffeine. I thought sharing this really great little native shrub was a nice way to wrap up Pollinator Week. I hope you continue to think about how we can support our pollinators. Um, think about in your ecological restoration, uh, dry, uh, sandy, open sites, consider this shrub um, or on your own properties as a foundation planting, um, mass shrub planting, something like that. This species is great to support a wide variety of wildlife. It smells good and it's beautiful. I hope you were able to get out um, and continue to get out and enjoy our native pollinators. Take care.